Hey folks, back again with more uh, Gravity Falls. This time it's Season 1, Episode 9, The Time Traveler's Pig. And this was a really fun one. I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, so this was where uh, a time traveler from the future is investigating the Gravity Falls Fair for uh, temporal anomalies. And uh, Dipper steals his time machine so that he can try to fix his uh, encounter with Wendy. It reminds me very much of a short story I read in college that I do not remember the title of, but, uh, and in fact may actually have been a play now that I think about it. But either way, it was something I read in an English class in college, and it was uh, this man and this woman meet, and every time either of them says or does anything, that ends their encounter, prevents them from hooking up. Uh, a buzzer sounds, and then the scene starts over. And it just does this over and over and over again until things quote-unquote work out for them. Uh, it's an interesting approach. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about Dipper in this episode, um, because, I mean, there's definitely some of what I've been worried about in the past with him getting a little bit nice guy syndrome-y, uh, the way in which Robbie is depicted as being like this total jerk, uh, and lines like, yeah, but he's a jerk with Take pants who plays guitar, stuff like that. That's very. That's very much how bitter, angry nerds think the world works. It's not how the world actually works. Um, you know, and yet at the same time, I think the episode the episode kind of does show that because Wendy does not start dating Robbie because he wears tight pants and plays guitar, although the fact that she finds him attractive would be a factor, you know, um, and it's not, you know, and it's ridiculous to be bitter, like, oh, woe is me, I am less attractive than this other guy, and therefore super attractive woman goes out with him instead of me. Yeah, okay, fine, but uh, how many women are you ignoring? while focused on this one super attractive one. Um, you know, it's a massive double standard. Uh, I don't know that that applies here, because it's very hard to tell from the animation style, you know, what anybody looks like would look... I mean, obviously, we can see what they look like, but would look like if this were live action, for instance. But... The th point is, that's not really how it plays out, what happens is she's in pain and Robbie helps her. And then they start dating. Like, it's an act of genuine niceness uh, that, that gets them together, as opposed to this elaborate scheming that Dipper is prone to. Uh, and, we, you know, we see that in this episode. His schemes just break the timeline and hurt Mabel. They don't actually succeed at getting him with Wendy, except briefly on a timeline where everything's messed up, at least from Mabel's perspective. And to his credit, Dipper can't go through with that. He, you know, is not, you know, completely callous or bitter. At least not yet. He's not even a little bit callous or bitter. He's just trying to figure things out and not doing a great job of it, and it doesn't really seem like there's anybody telling him better. So he's muddling through things on his own. And he's not doing a bad job of it, you know? But he did make the right choice, you know? Uh, help the person who's hurting. That's usually the right choice. So... Good on there, but I don't really want to talk about this episode in didactic terms. You know, th this show is not about teaching lessons. 
Um, and when I talk about stuff like Nice Guy Syndrome and, and the way it depicts Mabel and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm not saying the show should be teaching lessons. I'm not saying, you know, well, this show depicts, you know, you know, this kids are going to go out and be all oh, nice guy syndrome because of the show. That I honestly don't give a rat's ass about that. Uh, I'm not looking at it as the show is a cause of these sorts of things so much as it is a reflection of these sorts of things in our culture. Um, I'm not saying Gravity Falls has nice guy syndrome in it and is therefore bad. I'm saying Gravity Falls is a reflection of the nice guy syndrome in our culture and our culture is bad. Uh, there's there's a distinction there. Uh, I'm using the show as a vehicle to critique the larger culture, not attacking the show itself, because that's kind of pointless, in my view. When, you know, there's an entire culture to destroy, why focus your energies attacking one show? <laughs> Which is really just reflecting what's out there in the culture to begin with. So, and, and Gravity Falls isn't even a particularly bad example. I mean, compared to, like, any romantic comedy ever, it's doing great. Uh, and like I said, a lot of the times it does, like, this episode muddle its way around to having the characters who are basically decent people actually behave like basically decent people in the end. It just takes them a little while to get there. With the obvious exception of Grunkle Stan, but that's because Grunkle Stan is the lovable, horrible jerk. Uh... But, what's actually more interesting to me with this episode is the way it ties into this whole, cons you know, conspiracy paranoid viewing thing. Because I totally didn't see, uh, Blend and Blendin in any past episodes. I don't know if he was there or not. I'm guessing he actually probably was. I'm guessing, uh, when they're time traveling around, all those shots of him going back and fixing things... Um, I'm guessing we're actually footage from those episodes, uh, or, you know, either footage from those episodes cropped differently so that we can see, like, see him, or, you know, it might have been reanimated, but my, my point is, I, I think if I went back and rewatched those past episodes, I'd probably s spot him, uh, because that's exactly the kind of game that this show is playing. On the other hand, if he wasn't there in past episodes, that'd be kind of great, too, because, well, he was there now. Time travel's fun that way. Um, but either way, it's really playing around with, with these notions of, like, continuity and seeding clues and uh, basically the whole show is this conspiracy, because normally that kind of little background seeding of clues, hints here and there, a, ca a recurring character in the background who then becomes more significant in a later episode, that's something you pay off in an event episode. That's something you pay off in a season finale or, uh, you know, episode 100 or, you know, so something that has a significant number to it, you know? Um, Doctor Who... Uh, particularly under Russell T. Davies. Less, it didn't do this in the classic era, hardly ever, and it does something different under Moffat. But under Russell T. Davies, Doctor Who did this every season. It would build up this kind of uh, very clearly labeled background element, but the meaning of it was, like, it was very clearly marked as being in some way significant but the meaning of it would not become clear until right before the finale. And then it would be, you know, oh, massive revelation, Q finale. Here we get a recurring, weird-looking background dude building up to a shaggy dog story. Because, of course, he came into the past to fix the time anomalies caused by Dipper and Mabel playing with the time machine that he used to come back. You know, it's it's a predestination paradox, uh, which isn't really a paradox. A uh, better term for it would be an ontological loop. Um, 
but he came back to the past because he came back to the past. He's in all those shots because he's in all those shots. It's, there is no real cause. There is no underlying mystery, except in the sense that the mystery creates its own mystery. Um, the, and that's really cute, because, of course, with paranoid viewing, that's exactly what happens. The mystery creates its own mystery. Uh, viewers create these elaborate theories connecting together background details or stray remarks solely because they feel there needs to be such a thing, because that's the viewing mode that they're used to. Um, and it's not necessarily the viewing mode in which the show works. I think Gravity Falls is saying that it does work in that mode with this episode. Um, it's saying, yes, we are going to be doing things like this, where we seed stuff in past episodes and then pay it off here. And I mean, the diary in the uh, first episode was kind of a, a hint at stuff like that to come. There's, there's still the curious fact that uh, Grunkle Stan knows about this monitoring stuff, which has not been brought back at all that I'm aware of. <coughs> but, excuse me, but it's still, like, interesting that they're willing to be this playful with it, willing to kind of undercut it uh, for entertainment value, because that's kind of the show's aesthetic, is it is definitely willing to go there for the joke. Uh, not in the sense of, like, crudity or, you know, uh, bigoted humor or offensiveness or anything like that. This is still a Disney Channel show. But what I mean is it's willing to go against the normal rules of this kind of show for humor. Uh, and yet, after all is said and done, the only significant development is that Mabel now has the pig from the opening credits. Which is another hint to future events that was seeded in past episodes. But it's Mabel having a pet pig, which is adorable, and I love it, and I want to see lots more of Mabel and Waddles as, you know, a team. I'm assuming we're going to get a lot more of Mabel. I, I want Waddles to be now her, a constant companion. But in terms of paranoid viewing, in terms of assembling the vast conspiracy theory, Unless Blandon Blendon is right and Waddles really is their leader, um, this episode was all about undercutting its own buildup, which is why I refer to it as a shaggy dog story. It's anti-humor. It's humor that arises from doing, from, from doing the unexpected in a way that reduces the surprise. It reduces that feeling of, oh yes, this is a good ending. Yes, this is, you know, uh, it undercuts suspense. It undercuts laughter, really. Catharsis. That's the word I'm looking for. It undercuts any kind of catharsis that could come out of this, but in a way that's ironically funny. Because, yeah, here's the big payoff to the mystery of Blendon Blendon, folks. Mabel gets a pig. And I'm assuming that, you know, like I said, Blendon was in past episodes. Again, lead time on animation is so much that they could not have known this, but it's clear that they know fans. If Blendon was in past episodes, then fans on the internet noticed and started speculating about who he was. And... So this is a fun way of kind... You know, kind of like how last episode I was saying was a little bit mocking the fans. Um, I think this episode is, again, uh, having fun. But it's not a mean-spirited, ha-ha, you losers, you guys suck for watching us, or you guys are watching us wrong. No, it... The people making this show are clearly our people. 
Um, this this is participatory self uh, mocking. This this is self satire. They're making fun of our tendencies and inviting us to laugh with them as they are laughing at themselves as much as they are laughing at us because we are they so yeah a uh, really good episode really enjoyed it a lot uh looking forward to watching some more in coming weeks so thank you for uh backing watching sharing commenting whatever it is you do and I'll see you all next week. Bye. Hey, so if you enjoyed that video, uh, please feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if you'd like to see other stuff by me, uh, my blog, jdayblue.com, is, uh, you know, it exists. There's a link in the description. I blog six days a week about various things, all generally in the realm of talking about TV and movies, uh, occasionally books, occasionally comics, but mostly TV and movies, and mostly, mostly animation. Um, it's fun. You should check it out. In addition, uh, if you'd like to see more videos and are impatient, uh, you can do so at my Patreon. Uh, subscribers of five dollars or more a month get to see these videos a month in advance so there's if you go there right now there's gonna be at least three or four that you haven't seen um, there's also other rewards for other levels there's a two dollar level gets you early access to the uh, main Sunday posts that are the main purpose of my blog um, if, which are is an ongoing series about the DC animated universe. There's also uh, rewards for higher pledges. You can get ebooks. You can commission videos to make me watch other cartoons than the ones I normally cover. A uh, lot of options. Uh, again, link to that is in the description too. Link to my blog is in the description. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. Bye.